Good evening and welcome to the Monday, January 11, 2016 Board of Education meeting. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a, a very full agenda tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to reorder things to tr accommodate the greatest number of people that I can. Um, we do have a, a two uh, uh, special invited guests, uh, uh, State Representative Sean Scanlon of uh, the 98th District, am I right, in Guilford, uh, representing Guilford and South Guilford, if you will, and Stony Creek, <laughs> and Representative uh, Vin Candelora of North Branford, who represents North Guilford. Uh, roughly north of Route 80. Um, the, uh, we always invite our, our legislators to uh, join us at our first meeting before the session. Uh, Senator Kennedy just called me and he is unable to make it because of another commitment, but I'll ask him to come back to another uh, meeting uh, in due course. So I'd like, with the board's permission, that if we can call on uh, our representatives now to give us an update about what's happening in Hartford and we can pass along some issues uh, we have to them. Hello. And then we'll try to reorder the rest of the agenda again to accommodate the greatest number of people possible. So uh, have you flipped the coin to see who goes first? Or? We flipped and I won. Uh, <laughs> so you go second? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to all the members of the board. and. Mr. Freeman, uh, for inviting us here to say a few words. And uh, I got to tell you, the last Board of Ed meeting we did was in a very different building. <laughs> uh, this is a much nicer library to be meeting in. So um, congratulations to everybody in the faculty here and the staff for really rolling this place out with a, a great accomplishment. And it looks beautiful every time I come here. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, Vinny and I are, are about a month away from, a couple, two weeks away from the next legislative session. Um, and I'll just speak briefly about one issue that has really occupied a lot of my time in Hartford, and then I'll kick it to Vinny, and then we can ask or answer any questions you have. But um, right after I got elected in December of 2014, I met with Guilford Day, um, and I spoke with them about the rise in prescription drug abuse and heroin abuse in our school system. Um, we have been fortunate in Guilford that it is not as prominent here as it is in other districts across the state. Um, but when I got into office in January of last year, uh, I decided as a member of the Public Health Committee to try and learn as much as I could about this epidemic that's happening in Connecticut and all over the country. Um, today in Connecticut, we have more people dying from overdoses from opioids than we do from car accidents. Um, and that staggering statistic speaks to a very uh, pronounced need to get people the help they deserve. Um, a lot of times mental health and addiction, as you all know, are very much stigmatized. Um, and we do a great job here, obviously, in our school systems and with our local health providers, uh, but we can always do more. And so I've sort of made that issue a very uh, big highlight of my first term, uh, and I was able to pass a bill uh, that tried to address this in a number of different ways. Um, one by making sure that uh, Narcan, which is a life-saving tool that's used to stem the tide of an overdose, is available uh, over the counter from pharmacists. Number two, that we gave doctors continuing medical education when it came to uh, prescribing opioids. And number three, that anytime somebody was going to go get a prescription for a more than 72-hour supply of an opioid, that they would have to check a database to make sure that they weren't going from doctor to doctor to doctor. Um, in September of last year, Day and I partnered up with the Guilford Police, and in two hours we collected more than 60 pounds of uh, controlled substances that people had just in their medicine cabinets. And the CDC and experts here in Connecticut all point to the fact that one of the main drivers of this epidemic is that people don't know how to properly dispose of these drugs once they're expired or unused. Um, when a young person gets their wisdom teeth out, they might get 30 Vicodin pills. They might use three of them, and 27 then go on a cabinet. And so we were having many parents come in who had generations of students that are now in college or married or have their own kids, but their pills were still in their medicine cabinet. And so um, a lot of this is about education, and I welcome all of you to join us in this effort to try to make sure that people, A, know how to dispose of these things, like at our police station here in Guilford. There's a box that you can go and confidentially drop your stuff in. Um, but also just to make sure that if there are things that you're seeing as uh, members of the Board of Education that we could do better to help our young people 
uh, avoid these kinds of drugs. I hope you'll contact myself and Vinny um, so that we can try to address this at the state level if there are things that you can do. And with that said, I'll kick it over to my friend and colleague, uh, Representative Candelora. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, as Representative Scanlon pointed out, that certainly is going to be a big issue addressing the opioid usage. Um, we're going into uh, the short session, which is supposed to be focusing on primarily budget issues. Um, but I think matters such as uh, the opioid epidemic, the heroin overdose epidemic in Connecticut, is something that the legislature is going to take up on a bipartisan level to, um, to address it. You know, piggybacking off of that, um, we had legislation sort of trying to address, um, you know, the medical marijuana, how marijuana is perceived now that we've changed both the criminal uh, enforcement and the, um, uh, the prescriptive nature of it. And so we're trying to look at um, sort of directing that into more of a research-based, clinical-based um, method where people won't be, you know, smoking that in order to, um, uh, to treat illnesses. And so I think that also will help hopefully in the perception um, that our students do have on drug use um, and try to curb this epidemic that, that Connecticut is facing. We are um, going into a difficult budget cycle yet again. I think this is our ninth year of, of deficits. We're looking at about 550 million. And um, so it's, it's, it's going to be very challenging over the 13-week session uh, to try to address that budget shortfall. And, um, and I think that's, that's where a lot of our activity and efforts are going to end up going toward. Um, so with that, you know, we're certainly we're here to answer any yeah. questions. So um, we just wanted to give you that brief update. And I have uh, really two comments. Uh, I applaud uh, your efforts to curb uh, opiate use. There's, a, there's another factor to it, and as you <clears throat> pointed out, there are prescriptions and uh, bottles in people's medicine cabinets for years. Sometimes very young children, age two, get into that and ingest those very potent for them overdoses. And uh, as a pediatrician, I've seen that, and that is a horror show. So I applaud trying to get rid of it, and the more we can collect and dispose of through the police, the better we are. But my other comment had to do with something that this board has been struggling with now for over a year, and that is the issue of start time. And we continue to struggle with, uh, with the cost, with the uh, multiple problems related to changing it, and so on. And as uh, Dr. Canapari has pointed out, this really is a public health issue. And I would hope that the state would look at this regionally instead of having each little town struggle with it themselves. Uh, so far in Connecticut, one town has passed that test and has changed. Uh, others struggle, and we continue to struggle. Yes, yeah, so in North Brantford, we actually went in the other direction. It started school 20 minutes earlier. Um, <laughs> Why? Which, I, I'm not sure, but you know, what I've noticed is a lot of parents end up driving the kids to school now instead of waiting for the bus because you save that that 15 minutes. Um, I served on a task force that was dealing with ECS and cost savings for schools, and, and it was roughly six years ago. And we looked at the issues of trying to create uniform policies for schools to save money um, and also look at best practices. And one of them was trying to create a unified school calendar um, so that that would help with regionalizing transportation. Uh, we found it was very difficult to do and ended up kind of peeling off of it because there were just so many factors that went into creating a school calendar and every district was different and it was driven on, you know, the co contracts and, and what worked for each district. So it's a, it's a real tough issue, um, but I am familiar with it. You know, I've looked at it as well, uh, just the impact on, on student learning. We certainly could take a look at it at the legislative level. Um, and, and see if there is any expertise out there, or, you know, possibly looking at a task force to address the issue. But I know Connecticut in general has been really, you know, squishy about getting involved with um, 
with regionalizing, you know, educational needs. You know, I, I usually encourage you guys to be less involved in our daily lives, and my, my colleagues around the state wouldn't be thrilled with me. But part of the difficulty that we run in looking at it locally is that we do cooperate with other school districts in so many ways. Um, shared services, magnet programs, and athletics being a huge one. This is actually a place that I will step away from my usual script. I would encourage um, the state to look at. I mean, we, we did it around. Um, we did it around CAP testing a few years ago and CMT testing, that none of those tests could begin before 9 o'clock in the morning because we recognized the importance of that. I would applaud and would be willing to, to speak at a state level about considering this at a state level rather than encouraging all of the local districts to, to wrestle with it alone because you're wrestling against not only your own local issues but your neighbors who surround you because you do work with them in so many different ways. Yeah. Well, let me revert to form then and, and ask, <laughs> ask for some more flexibility. You know, you probably saw that the No Child Left Behind has been uh, amended or repealed and has been replaced uh, by a new law. The new law gives states much greater latitude to decouple standardized testing from teacher evaluations. Um, we have been pretty uh, adamant and pretty vocal at the state level that we would like to see that happen. Uh, we'd like to, I think we, we unanimously believe across party lines that we think that this is something that we don't really need the state's help on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we don't really need uh, the linking to standardized tests. That was just not a productive uh, approach. And I think, I think we agree that we'd like to encourage the, the General Assembly to take a very hard look at that issue mm -hmm. and, and, and and give us the the flexibility that we think we it would best uh, serve our particular educational needs here. Well, I would just say to that, and, and Vinny can certainly chime in when he wants. Um, you know, it's great to see Congress passing a law of that magnitude. I think that for a long time, many people have said that Washington is broken. And in the last couple of weeks here, we've seen some movement on a big number of issues: the transportation bill and education bill. Um, I hope that we find the same spirit in Hartford uh, this coming February and sort of put aside some of the, the questions that we have to deal with uh, and look at them from a bipartisan lens, as you all do here on a very often basis. And I think this hopefully will be one of them. Um, you know, I think August 1st is the day that the mandate technically ends uh, of this year. Um, and in this session, I think the education commissioner that is appointed by the governor um, has said that in the next coming weeks she plans to try to come up with a solution to this. Uh, I know the unions have also announced that they plan to submit their own plan to try to keep teachers accountable while also not coupling them. So um, I think it's going to come up in this session and I think we'll have to address it and I think that hearing from all of you what your opinion on this is, is very important and I obviously encourage all parents to and teachers, frankly, to weigh in as well so that we have the tools it takes to have this conversation effectively uh, on your behalf in Hartford. Yeah, I don't know of anybody in the General Assembly that supports the coupling of testing with teacher evaluation. I've so yet that means to come the vote across. will be unanimous too. Uh, I, I, I've yet to come <laughs> that across anybody that news. said that was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That'd be good. Well, we'll, we, well, anything you need from us in terms of helping, uh, we'll be glad to do. It, it just. It, it needs to get fixed. And, and, and for what it's worth, I, I would just add that this board in this community, I think, has a, sort of a, a sophisticated opinion on it. We are wholly supportive of continuing a, a reasonable amount of annual assessment because we need information about how well our students are doing. We had nearly 100 percent participation in the standardized assessments that were done last year. Um, we absolutely agree and believe that our teachers need to be held to a high standard and should be evaluated and supported in their work. Um, but to have a specific prescriptive plan that comes out of Hartford and doesn't just tie it to annual assessments, but tells us exactly how much of a teacher's evaluation needs to be down to the half a percent of a teacher. So um, it's absolutely a good opportunity. And I, I again, I'll just offer that if, if you're looking for a place that has investment in assessment because we want to know how our kids are doing and how we can support those students and investment in teachers. Um, we're not looking to throw away both baby and bathwater here. We just want to have the ability to do it well at our own level. At any time, I'd be happy to show you around and bring you behind the scenes of how we're supporting teachers and how we're looking at assessment in the district and, and, and help 
questions if you need to make that argument okay. or offer my services if you need someone to come up and speak to that argument. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I guess one other issue is that we, we the town is actually facing an, an, a mid-year uh, budget uh, uh, cut in ECS of a little over $100,000 at least under the governor's proposed uh, rescissions. Uh, what's, what's the situation there? <clears throat> so uh, essentially what's happened is the governor has made rescissions because of the budget shortfall this year, the projected deficit. So it is an actual cut um, that all, basically all municipalities are seeing of different magnitudes. So I think Guilford is about 113,000. Correct. Um, and and the, way, the way the cut was done, as I understand it, there was an across the board cut to pilot um, based on a formula. If a town's pilot wasn't large enough um, to sustain the cut, it, it then carried into ECS. So for instance, when you look at it, you'll see, I know North Brantford and Guilford both received sizable cuts to ECS, whereas Madison s did not see a sizable cut to ECS because their cut fell into their pilot, presumably because they have Hammond Asset Beach, so they get a lot more pilot money than, than their neighboring towns. Do you define pilot? Yeah. It's, sorry, yep, the, the pilot is payment in lieu of taxes, which is, um, it, it comes by way of state-owned land. So if there's state property that's in your town, the state will give you money because you can't collect tax revenue from it. Uh, they'll give you this money in lieu of those taxes that you otherwise would have received if it was privately owned. Um, so essentially, we, we saw this $113,000 cut to Guilford. In the next budget cycle, there is a slight increase to Guilford. I think it's about 20,000 for ECS. Um, I'm not sure that will be sustained looking at the deficit that we're being faced with, uh, but that's how it, it came to be. Um, it was not done through the initiative of the legislature. Um, I think it, it's not helpful to cut a town or a school system mid-year when we're, you're already in your, your, your budgeted um, you know, your budgeted year. There's not a way for you to generate more revenue. And we recognize that, but, but our hands are certainly tied. And I would just add that um, as we've seen in, in my first year of the legislature, we've had, I think, three special sessions, and most of them have had to do with the budget. Um, and when we tried to deal with the last budget, which was this December, both parties sort of released their internal documents and, and presentations of their proposals, and both sides kept towns harmless in that right. proposal. Um, we have tried a, as a conscious effort as Democrats and Republicans in the legislature to hold you all harmless in terms of municipal aid, and obviously the governor has decided to go in a different route, and as Vinny said, there's nothing we can do about that. We don't have to ratify that decision. He doesn't have to come to us for <coughs> approval to do those rescissions, um, but our hope, or at least my hope as a legislator, and I think I speak for my colleague here is that we want to continue to try to hold towns harmless because we know uh, that when we don't, you simply pass that on to the same people um, that are our constituents as well. Um, and uh, we think that, you know, or I think that the best way to maintain the excellence that you guys have is not to continuously cut, cut, cut your funding. And so um, we're already working as a town, Guilford, with a lot less than other places in the state. Um, and so uh, I would like to make sure that we're you know, getting any feedback from you about what this cut might have on you uh, this year and then as we head into next year, work to be able to tell the story of what Guilford has been, uh, you know, doing with less uh, to prove that we need more. Okay. Great. Other, other questions, comments, concerns? Do you have any questions or comments or anything you'd like, uh, like to ask us? I would just say thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I'm not on the Education Committee. I, I don't think Vinny is. I know that Ted is not. So um, if there are things that are happening this year uh, on the committee and you could let us know that, that'd be great. Um, we can certainly talk to our colleagues who are on that committee and um, discuss with them any proposals that you have concerns about and speak to the chairs and the ranking members. Um, but overall, our doors are always open to all of you and, and your expertise and your knowledge about uh, the things that are happening in our, in our public school system, and we certainly appreciate the feedback anytime you ever give it to us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you both very much. All right. Um, so let me go back to the agenda. Uh,
and, and again, I'm, I'm going to try to accommodate as many people as, or as quickly as possible. We do have a, this is our January budget meeting, and it's a very, very full meeting. Um, is, are there people here specifically for the budget presentation? Not so much. Are there people here specifically for the, does that make you feel better? <laughs> I'm a little let down, actually. Okay, fine. Or worse. It could be worse, yeah. yeah. Who are people here for the high school start times discussion? Okay. Let me just tell you, give me the, give you the plan on that. There's a presentation by uh, one of our outside consultants specifically relating to bus uh, scheduling. That's the only discussion that's going to be tonight. Uh, so there's going to be, we're going to have that, and I'll try, I think we'll try to do that fairly quickly because she lives in a very distant part of the state, and, and, uh, and we did, by the way, we've been at meeting since 5 o'clock today, and we spent an hour and a half uh, on this issue already as a board, so um, we're going to try to maybe do that a little quicker. Now, I, I, because I am able to read my email, I know that there are some people here on artificial turf issues as well. Can you just a show of hands who's here on artificial turf? All right. Um, I, it's not on the agenda. All right, I don't want to cut anybody off. Uh, and, and if you want to stay till the end of public comments, which is after everything else, technically that's when we're supposed to do this. On the other hand, you know, if we could keep it kind of short-ish, uh, uh, then maybe we could turn to that right after the, uh, uh, well, maybe, we, who, who here is, who here, let me, let me just say, the reason this is not on the agenda is there's nothing for the Board of Education to do on this issue. The Board of Education was asked by the Standing Fields Committee in May of 2015 what we thought about uh, the possibility of adding another turf field in, a, in lieu of a natural grass field up kind of adjacent to the existing high school uh, football field at, the, at this building. Um, we discussed it and and uh, then voted, actually, uh, to say that if it could be done within budgetary uh, uh, guidelines and there was going to be money left over, uh, well, there's going to be an expense either way for natural turf or artificial turf, but if it could be done in a way where there was absolutely no risk of cost overruns, that we thought it was a reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, then it went from Standing Fields Committee to the, to the High School Building Committee. The High School Building Committee, I think, considered it over a period of months and then voted in December to go forward with it, uh, again, with some with continuing to, well, I, I voted to go forward with it pending uh, bidding uh, and, and, and prices. That's where it is right now. It's not in front of the Board of Education. The Board of Education has not been asked to do anything. Uh, I'll be glad to summarize more what the process was that, that uh, as, as I understand it, but like I say, it's not on the agenda and there isn't any, there's not going to be a vote on this tonight uh, by the Board of Education unless somebody asks for it to be added to the agenda. Uh, and I don't know what the vote would be anyway because that is controlled by the, the, the Guilford High School Building Committee. But having said that, the people that raise their hands that are here for something to do with the turf fields, the Who's here to speak in favor of what the process has been up to this point in the decision of the high school committee? Okay, who's here against the process of the high school committee? Okay, here I will make a proposal. You, you, you have two choices. You can either stay until the end of the meeting, and that's and you're, then you're willing, you're able to, to speak as you wish within some limits. Uh, you know, we, we, that may be 11 o'clock uh, or 10 o'clock. Or if you, if, if you believe that it could be, we could, we could f close that within a half an hour, I'd be happy to, I'll, I can move it up. Fair or not fair? Because it's not on the agenda. I'm not, you know, this happened, nobody, nobody suggested that this be added to the agenda. Nobody emailed me. Nobody said, could we put it on an agenda? Nobody said, is there any vote coming up? It's not a Board of Education issue right now. It's just not. So, I mean, if, can we, if, we, if we are confident that we can wrap this up in a half an hour, I'll move, you, I'll move it up until after the, the bus uh, issue. Is that fair? Okay, well, just hold on. So we'll try to, yes. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm aware of that. I, I, we do that all the time. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, they, they, they will tell you that we take care of the, the student reps. Uh, they, they, uh, they, wouldn't you say? Yeah, See, they're smart kids, too. Um, 
Okay, and, and is there anybody here for anything else? Okay, then what I'm going to propose that we do is we'll do student reps right now, uh, then we'll do the bus presentation, then we'll go to the turf fields, and again, just we'll try to do this as quickly as we can, then we'll go to the budget, then we'll go back to the agenda. Does that seem reasonable, everybody? Okay, you're on. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll start off with Guilford Lakes. Um, just quickly, the students in second grade have been discussing the scientific process, um, and students conducted experiments in physics and with states of matter. Uh, and there was recently the school-wide winter sing-along, and students sang songs that they have been practicing during their music classes, and it was a huge success. Uh, moving on to news from Baldwin, the a sixth grade chorus sang the national anthem at the Quinnipiac University hockey game versus Union College last Thursday, January 7th, and they did a great job, and the game was also won by Quinnipiac University, which is, of course, our home state, uh, which is exciting. Uh, the Coco Cafe, which we both remember, is a Baldwin tradition, and it was another big success on Wednesday, December 23rd. Um, the students were treated to music by the members of the band and orchestra, were able to enjoy hot cocoa and cookies, and visit with their friends prior to the holiday break. So that's just a good way to kind of finish off their, their school before they go off on their break. Uh, and the grade six students are going to Boston Museum of Science tomorrow and Thursday of this week, and they're all very excited to visit the museum. And you are all invited to see the Winter Orchestra Concert, which is scheduled for Monday, February 1st, and the Winter Band Concert, which is scheduled for Tuesday, February 9th. So we'd love to see you there. Um, and Maddie will give some other updates. All right. So moving on to Calvin Lee, I spoke to Mr. Grimm, and it seems each grade is working very hard, starting with kindergarten students who are working with nonfiction texts as they begin a unit on informational how-to books, and then... First graders continue to practice, practice efficient addition and subtraction strategies within 20, build an understanding of place values, and even solve story problems with pictures, numbers, and words. Then the second graders recently visited Big Y and had a really fun time there. They specifically showed interest in the Nuval of product, and they like to record those and compare them. And then the third grade students are beginning an informational opinion unit, so they're picking articles and getting different topics and then forming their own opinions based on what they read. And lastly, fourth grade students are learning about fractions, including addition and subtraction, and then just investigating equivalent fractions and comparing them. And then moving on to Adams, the seventh grade band and jazz band concert will be tomorrow night, if anyone would like to attend that. And on Friday, February 5th, the Student Council is planning and working hard to have a dance at the school. And some pretty exciting news is that two students named Kiana Vallo and Casey Goldberg were recently selected to have their artwork displayed in the 26th Annual Regional Scholastic Art Awards, which is pretty exciting news for Adam, so they're pretty proud about that. And now moving on to the high school, um, winter sports season is in full swing. All the teams are pretty far into their games, and a pretty um, exciting event was on Friday when the girls, boys, girls and boys varsity basketball teams had their doubleheader at hand. Unfortunately, both teams lost, but I'm sure they're going to work pretty hard to beat them next time. And so in regards to the new school, everybody is very accustomed to all the new technology and used to the new features, and so um, that's very good. And the new student parking lot was actually just finished. You can see Mr. Vicente out there every morning directing the traffic. <laughs> and um, he will also be meeting with the senior class officers to discuss senior parking privileges. And then after midterms, parking decals are starting to be checked. And all students who had a pass first semester will be given back $20 because it was a dirt, uh, the dirt lot which, which didn't require much maintenance. So that's nice. Uh, in other news at the high <coughs> school, um, West Side Story, the rehearsal process is in full swing and, and, and lots of exciting progress is being made. Um, the college process is in a bit of a lull at this point. Um, the next wave of decisions will be released in the spring, the early spring, um, and it varies by college, of course. Uh, and as Maddie briefly mentioned, midterm exams will be taking place next week, so it's a very busy time for your students, but everyone seems to be handling it very well. Are there Great. any questions? Can we questions? Any comments? Comments? Thoughts? Thoughts? Well, you're, you, we're continuing to look at the start time issue, as I'm right. sure you know, and I know that this, there was a student survey, and so we'll, you know, any, any input you, you all have uh, uh, on behalf of the student body, I think just 
keep us in keep us in the loop. Okay. If I could just like make a quick little statement on that at this point. I know there was there was a survey that went out and was taken by like, I hope most students because it was emailed and actually in a couple classes the teachers were having their students do it just to make sure that it was like reported on. Um, and I I'm interested to see the results from that as I think many people are. Um, I I think that what we've heard has been largely more negative feedback in terms of like whether they would be in support of the later start times and I think that was primarily because of the complication of it in that um, it seems that there really isn't at this point like a, a perfect option and that is something that is being discussed but at this point from what the students have heard and what we've heard from the students um, it, it's just been that it seems a little too complicated. Mark, can I can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, I um, I know you you and you and I spoke briefly about this, but right. the um, students met in advisory groups mm -hmm. before the break for I think a half an uh -huh. hour. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that has come up in our discussions um, about the community in general, but I'm asking about um, students specifically. Do you feel that um, is it your sense that students have um, have received kind of all the information they might need. Um, you mentioned complication, and maybe you can't answer this. It's kind of hard to to know what you don't know. But mm -hmm. do you, do you have a sense that um, that students feel kind of um, well informed on this issue? Um, I think that when we took the survey, I know it explained after or before each question what the implications of it would be with buses and sports and things like that. So I would hope that while taking the survey, the students would take those things into consideration and kind of had a little more of an idea about it than they did to taking or to previously. At the, at the same time, I do think that just because it is so complicated, much of, like the source of the like unhappiness with the proposals was just that it was so complicated. And I think it probably wouldn't have seemed so complicated. Like it is, it is very complicated. There is no simple solution. and. I think that's that's just being reflected in the amount of like understanding that the students have of it. So, okay. I to answer your question simply, I, I don't think that there is like a really strong understanding of all the options okay. that have been put forth. Okay. But is there an understanding about what are the benefits? I know it's complicated. Right. But what about are there any? Do the students perceive an advantage to a, to a later start time? Do you want to take this? Sure. Um, I feel like most of the students are kind of focusing on the negative impacts of it rather than the advantages from what I've heard. Okay. I mean, it, we're, we're asking you to represent a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I, exactly. I recognize yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but you've been so kind of helpful and, you know, uh, so we won't hold you to it for sure. <laughs> um, but it's just helpful to get a, a sense and, and, um, and, and just we're trying to make sure that um, in some ways, uh, we as a board have been thinking about this and talking about this for a while. Um, it did feel like um, this, the advisor groups and then the survey and all that rolled out very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I got some feedback from um, a small group of students that um, felt like what happened in the advisor group um, wasn't as informative as it might have been. And, no doubt there was some variation. But I appreciate whatever you're able to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, get, get, get home and start studying for the midterms. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one other comment. I think you were on the program at the CMEA regional yep. uh, music, which That's wasn't mentioned. But oh. Uh, this okay. that happened this last weekend. It's just incredibly impressive uh, how many Guilford students are represented at the regional <coughs> level. We're one of the, the high quality of the music there. Most highly participating schools in the it's the CME Connecticut Music Educators Association Southern Regionals uh, Festival. So that's in it, there are many different musical groups, but our band, orchestra, and choral students are all represented there. So thank you for Terrific. reminding me that. Shouldn't we be hosting that? Yeah. Uh, you know we have a great facility to host it in moving forward. We should absolutely look to host that. Why are we hosting that? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's, I think let's I could have that conversation. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right.
Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. So we're going to we're going to turn to the to the presentation. I think, that, Dr. Freeman, this is technically under your report, but uh, we we have already spent an hour uh, hour and a half on this uh, before this meeting. Um, the 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 genesis of this is that. One of the issues that we talked about, and a lot members of the community talked about a lot as we were uh, reviewing the high school start time, is are we doing the busing in as efficient a way as, as possible, in a reasonable way as possible, and what would the impacts be of a, of a different start time, different possibilities of start times on transportation? Is there something we can do to help that out? And so we, we talked to uh, a few possible consultants, but then wound up retaining District Management Council. It's a very respected uh, organization that we actually, uh, that has done studies on special education services and transportation services for many school districts around the state to t try to answer some of these questions because we really, as our student reps uh, indicated, this is maybe the most complicated uh, issue uh, that we have been involved in lately and every time you pull one thread that seems to f break free another thread and so the transportation thread is a not insignificant piece of this and so we we thought we'd like to try to get some more data. <laughs> So, do, Dr. Freeman, do you want to introduce this? I'd be happy to. Um, the only thing that I would want to reiterate is, as Mr. Bloss said, uh, we've had about 90 minutes of conversation on this topic already. Um, there are some follow-up questions that we've already cataloged for DMC that Dr. Ullman and I will work on following this meeting. What we'd like to do tonight and what I'm pleased to do is to introduce Dr. Diane Ullman, uh, who is a respected former superintendent from the state of Connecticut, uh, is currently serving as a senior advisor for District Management Council uh, has partnered with us and our staff in district on this review of the transportation services and is here tonight to share that overview with all of us publicly and to some degree entertain further conversation and further questions. Uh, I will note um, that Dr. Ullman comes to us at a very high level at District Management Council, did not work on all of the nuts and bolts of this report. And so again, our responses this evening, um, if there's a question that we can answer quickly and efficiently, then we'll do so. But again, and I've said this every time we've raised this conversation, tonight is not the final word on this topic. So I know that there will be other um, topics, other questions that we will record tonight and then bring back to the board at a later date to discuss further. Um, Dr. Ullman, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here this evening. Is this on? Yeah, yeah that actually records. Uh, so oh. you want to. Okay. One records and one should project as well. So it should help everybody hear you. Okay. Just leave it as it is. <laughs> Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, thank you for inviting me here this evening. It's um, a pleasure to, to be here before the Guilford Board of Ed and um, to present um, the findings of the study. Um, I would just say that the District Management Council is a Boston-based firm, uh, but I am a Connecticut native, so um, I know the, the Connecticut environment quite well. And um, we do this kind of work not only in New England, but across the country, and have done a number of transportation studies. And I would say uh, right out of the gate that um, it was such a pleasure working with the staff here um, just completely cooperative, totally dedicated to this task, and they were great partners, and we couldn't have produced the report that we have tonight without, without all of the help and support, particularly of Jason Bowden, and where is, is Chip still here? I think Chip okay, may have. He might have uh, gone I think home, he went but home. anyway, um, the district transportation office has been extremely helpful. Um, you already have a good transportation system, so what we're looking at is starting with a, a base of um, some very good practices. And um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Freeman for noting that I am not the person with every bit of the nuts and bolts detail. And any question that you have that I can't answer, we will be absolutely certain to get back to you with information. Um, and I, I also probably want to just start this by saying that I think you're very wise to take this at a very um, thoughtful and measured pace because there are significant changes required regardless of um, uh, any particular scenario that you may or may not choose. Um, and there's just so many factors to consider. So um, I, we will present some of those this evening and um, what those implications are. And um, with that, I'll just um, jump into this presentation. <clears throat> So the presentation has two basic parts. One is um, to discuss 
the methods that we used in um, our um, general findings, and then also to look um, at two different scenarios that were developed as a result of all of the information that we gathered. Um, while many more scenarios uh, were potentially, um, that we, we could potentially have developed many more, we stuck with two that we thought <clears throat> were made the most sense. Um, some of them really just uh, from the outset, you could tell were not good options. And so we put those aside and we really focused our energies on two specific scenarios. So um, in terms of our overall process, um, first of all, we interviewed um, a wide number of um, individuals in the district and um, those key stakeholders were able to give us insight into uh, the way things work here in Guilford, uh, the sensibilities of the community, the expectations that the community has for its transportation system. They were also able to give us insight into a lot of the particulars. For instance, talking to the athletic director gave us really good information about how a change in start times might impact athletics. So in general, we talked to district leaders, we talked to board members, we talked to the STA um, bus company representatives. Um, as I said, we talked to the athletic director, the guidance counselors, we talked to some parents. And I don't want to say that we had a very broad sampling of those groups, but we did talk to individuals that, um, that we thought would um, lend uh, credible information to this process. Secondly, we conducted a ridership um, survey. And we, what we did was uh, we actually took stock of which students or how many students rode the bus um, throughout a, a specific week. And so the drivers would actually mark down how many students were on the bus in the morning, how many students were in the bus in the afternoon. And we were able then to take that information and compare it against bus capacity and so forth. Um, we also took stock of the current length of the bus rides. Um, knowing that there are certain bell times that buses need to arrive within and um, after. Uh, we were very uh, cognizant of the fact that it's important to know how long each run takes. And so the, those two bits of information became um, baseline for us as we began to think about what scenarios would actually work here. And finally, we developed the two scenarios. Um, and we did this very, working very closely with STA. Um, and um, these two scenarios that you're going to see tonight are not precise models, so they won't tell you exactly how the transportation, um, how the particular scenario would work. There's much more detailed information that needs to be gathered in order to get to that level, precise level of detail. Um, and so as you start to move towards perhaps looking at one more one model more closely than another, then some modeling can be done. And some of the precise information includes things like knowing exactly where the bus stops are going to be, knowing exactly how many students would be at each bus stop, knowing um, exactly um, the length of the rides based on where students are picked up. So some of that information is not knowable right now. And so we did the study with the things that were knowable, knowing that there's another layer of information that the district has to collect to determine both the feasibility and the eventual cost of each transportation option. You know, our recommendation would be that you start with the one that seems most logical and reasonable for this community, do the modeling on that one. And I'm not here to tell you which one it is. I'm just here to tell you that that would be a good way to proceed forward with, you know, based on the information that you have. I would say out of the gate that um, there are two, th well, there's at least one thing that we know for sure is that both of these models require the use of what we would call cluster stops. Now, cluster stops are already something that the district does in many instances, and um, we had some conversation tonight. So we know that cluster stops is, it's already a practice here in Guilford. It may not be um, uh, as widespread as, um, as it would be under these scenarios, but it is a practice that you already have in place. So, but each of these scenarios would require cluster stops throughout the district. That said, um, some students would not be at a cluster stop because their street might not be safe, uh, because just the location of the houses on the street. So all of that is part of the further detail that would need to be determined. But as a general rule, the cluster stop notion would be applied. Um, and so um, I'm going to just now move into um, talking about um, 
two scenarios. Uh, well, first of all, this slide is about your current practice. So just noting here that you currently um, have a three-tiered bus system. Uh, the second tier actually serves two different schools, and so you can see that the number of buses needed uh, for the high school is lower than the middle school and the elementary because there's only one high school. And at the other two tiers, you're going to multiple places. You can see what the um, start times and end times are here and the earliest and the latest drop-off. One of the things that's notable on this slide is that the ridership of the high school buses is at about 35%, meaning that on any given day or the days that we did our survey, we, had, we saw approximately 35% of the available seats being used on the bus. What that says to us is that there is some excess capacity there. And this is um, a survey that you would probably want to repeat because we did it for one week in time. You would want to see if that same pattern occurred when you did the survey again. But what it says to us is that you're not, your buses are not being used at full capacity. So when we look at scenarios, we can assume, um, a we can assume that a certain number of seats will be empty and we can propose to fill those seats. So, in working with the district and ST, STA, we have proposed um, in these scenarios a relatively modest um, assumption of increase in uh, ridership on those buses. So um, knowing that, say, only 35% of the high school seats are filled on a routine basis, we can assume in a scenario that we would want to fill the bus maybe up to 50% or 60%. There's not a precise formula that was used to add um, an estimated capacity to the buses, but it was, I want to say, a very cautious estimate. Um, I think the district does things in a very um, uh, cautious and um, in a way that's very conscious of making sure that students are safe. So um, I, I think the numbers are very safe numbers. Um, some places might actually push those a little further. We thought that given um, the expectations in this community and student safety issues, we did not want to push the number of presumed riders um, really at a very high level. So um, this represents um, what you currently do. Uh, one of the things to note is that because your geography requires buses to travel long distances, um, most students are picked up at their door. And, and, I, and I'm as, actually, after our conversation tonight, I'm not sure most is the appropriate word. Many, I would say many students are picked up at their door. And many are, are gathering at cluster stops. Um, but you actually use more buses than you need in order to get the students to school on time. So that's current practice. And under any delayed start scenario, it will be necessary to make changes to the pickup locations in order to allow each bus to pick up more students in a time efficient way to get students to school for the established bell schedule. So, um, a couple of big takeaways from your current scenario. We, um, so here's scenario one, um, and I want to say that for those of you who have been following this issue for some time, this is very much like the scenario that the superintendent um, and um, Jason proposed last year. It's a three-tier system. Um, and it, um, it's reversing the middle and the high school start times, and it could potentially save money, but um, it certainly would alter the school day. And you can see here that the alteration to the school day is um, significant. So middle school students uh, previously, um, I have my little chart here, middle school students um, formerly uh, were um, beginning school at 8 o'clock, and this would cause them, for instance, to start at 7.30. <sighs> Um, the um, 7.50 at Baldwin and 8 o'clock, I'm sorry, at Adams. The high school, um, oh, excuse me, in the, this is the current scenario, in the three-tiered model, the high school would start at 8.20, the middle school would start at 7.30, so there's really um, a, quite a substantial difference in the start time. So for the high school, we were looking at almost an hour difference in a three-tiered model. And for the middle schools, we're looking at approximately a half hour uh, to 40 minute difference. The elementaries um, would be starting, now they currently start um, at ninth, um, I'm sorry, at um, nine o'clock and in this scenario they would be at 9.30, so it's a half hour difference. So there's some very significant differences and uh, these are things that uh, the district should consider. 
um, there are some advantages to this scenario, and one is um, to lower the potential cost by increasing the number of students on each bus. So you currently have three tiers, and what this does is increase the number of students on each bus by creating those cluster stops, and um, therefore you can actually fit more students on the bus in, a, in an established time frame. Um, there's also greater flexibility to handle fluctuations in ridership. Um, so, and the, and the larger delayed start time than the next scenario. So if the purpose of this study is to create a delayed start time for high school students, this one um, creates um, a fairly significant delay in start time uh, for um, students. Trade-offs, however, for this three-tier uh, scenario is that nearly all students walk to a cluster stop. And I want to point out that the first bullet, the sub-bullet here says up to a half mile for grades K th through 8 and three quarters of a mile for 9 through 12. That's actually the district um, policy and it, it's, um, it, it's highly unlikely that very many, if any, students would walk three quarters of a mile, but we posted that because it is the current district policy. And depending on how the cluster stops are developed, it may be that high. What I'm hearing thus far from the board is that there is a desire to bring that down, that it is not a three-quarter of a mile walk for anybody, but that it's, you know, I'm not going to give you a number, but that there's general consensus. That's probably on the outer limits of where you would like to be. So um, past, every time past you the past, 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 past the outer limits. Yeah, <laughs> past the outer limits. Um, <clears throat> So anytime you start to play with uh, these parameters, then you start to be able you say, okay, the, if we're not going to have as many cluster stops, um, it will require more buses and more time. If you limit the walks time, then you start to play with the parameters. And when I talked earlier about um, developing scenarios, this is exactly what I was talking about. When you change one parameter, then the outcome changes. And so I think going forward what the district might want to do if you choose to further investigate a three-tier model you know try the the different parameters of maybe a half mile walk for the high school and and a lower amount for so you can um, the transportation system that you have will allow you to put in different variables and try out what those um, ride lengths will be um, assuming certain ridership and assu assuming certain stops along the route. And um, so the, the trade-offs are there, um, but and many students would walk to a cluster stop. Um, the earlier wake-up uh, wake time for the middle school, so um, if you look up here at the chart, the middle school starting uh, at 7.30 in the morning has an average pickup time of 6.45 a.m. And this is an estimate. It's not an exact precise number because we basically had to use some general information that we had. Again, as you place the stops very specifically based on where actual students live, you'll get more and more precise information. Um, and um, I think the other, at the other end, um, if you look at the end time for the elementary school, 4 o'clock, um, and the current end time uh, for the elementary school is at 325, so that's, you know, something there to get used to. So um, there are advantages and trade-offs to um, this three-tier model, but there are also um, trade-offs to the two-tier model. This slide in particular almost replicates the one that you saw before, and we have it here because it is the model that the district developed um, last year, and so they were very quite, quite, quite close to what we were able to come up with based on ridership, et cetera, of the, the study that we did. And um, the one issue here um, is that the three-tier model causes you to use all of your buses um, particularly for the middle school runs, and which is at the beginning of the day. Um, currently, you provide what we would call ancillary and courtesy transportation for students, and um, this model uses all of your available buses, and so it impacts your ability to do that ancillary transportation to programs that are outside of your schools here in um, Guilford. So, for instance, a, a VOAG school or uh, a magnet school, it might affect um, athletics. Um, 
So there are things that, um, and currently, I guess it's called courtesy uh, drop-offs, where if a student has an after-school activity or a child care provider, the district actually takes the student to that alternative location rather than their home. It impact, this three-tiered scenario um, impacts your ability to do that ancillary and courtesy transportation. I can't say that it eliminates it, but it really limits the amount of um, ancillary transportation that you can provide. And so that is certainly another um, issue to, to think about uh, with the three-tiered model. Uh, the second option is a two-tiered model, a um, lot simpler to look at and a lot simpler on the surface to implement, um, but, it, but it would certainly would cost more money, and, um, but it um, would have fewer impacts in terms of start time. So in this scenario, um, the high school and Adams would um, be on the same tier, which means that you have students in grades 7 through 12 riding the bus together, and you have students from the elementary through sixth grade riding the bus together. So um, you have fewer early morning pickups pick in this model. So you see that the average pickup time for the high school and the Adams school is 727, and at Baldwin and the elementary is 833. That's the average pickup time. Um, the average drop-off time is also um, qu quite um, compact. Um, there's less impact on grades K through 8, um, and there's less impact on athletics. So um, if, you, if you notice the, the high school start time at 8 o'clock, um, in the three-tiered model, it would have been 8.20. So you lose the 20 minutes, but you have less impact on athletics. That's an example of the kind of trade-off that you're looking at with the two-tiered model. Um, Again, nearly all students walk to a cluster stop. The same bullet, which says up to a quarter mile, three quarters of a mile, we know that you're really considering what you think reasonable. That's what your policy says, but it's unlikely that's where you want to end up in terms of walking distance to a cluster stop. Um, this does require adding buses, and it increases the overall cost. The exact number of buses is still not determined, but it is a significant cost. And the reason is that you need to transport what, what you have. You have a certain number of buses right now, and you divide them into three tiers. And now you take that same number of buses, and you have to divide them into two. And so you just you can't transport all of the students with the, the existing number of buses. You will need extra buses with this scenario. Um, and the larger age range of students, um, in some communities that might be a concern. I don't know if it is here, but putting K, K through 6 students together and 7 through 12 um, is what this would require. So advantages and disadvantages to the two-tier model. Um, and those are the, the basic options that I think make the most sense given all the information we collected from the stakeholders, from the ridership survey, um, as well as um, looking at some of the other um, information that STA was able to provide. So I'm going to stop there and see um, if you have questions. Yes. I, I do have one question, and um, it came up a little bit in our earlier discussion. Um, it's, it's in the difference between um, buses in the AM run and PM run. And I'm wondering if you would mind just going back to slide five, because where the schools are separate, I think it's easiest to look at. Um, so, for instance, the middle school number of buses AM and PM, we have an AM of 20 and a PM of 32. Yep. And we talked about um, different ridership. But I know in the, in the sample report we have, um, whether we're looking at the percent of students riding the bus, the <coughs> average utilization um, based on district capacity targets, or the average utilization based on maximum capacity of each bus, um, if we just, for instance, look at the middle school line, there is only a 4% increase um, from the AM to PM, 4 or 5%. Can you tell me which page you're working on? I'm on, I'm on the report, page 5. Okay. Okay. So if, um, if I look at the middle school line for the AM and the PM, I'm looking at a, a, either a 4 or a 5% increase. Um, so number of bus runs, 32, number of students? 70. Okay. In the morning, 74% in the afternoon. Um, if we look at average utilization based on district capacity targets, 45. 
in the AM 50 in the PM and then average utilization based on maximum capacity of each bus 34 in the AM and 38 in, in the PM. I guess my point is 4 or 5 percent of approximately 1,100 or 1,200 students is, is 60 students and I don't see how that equals 12 extra buses. So I, I guess I, I would love to see those numbers looked at again because buses and cost for us are going to be sure. a big yeah, piece we, we of talked, this. We talked about yeah, and so we did. Right. I've, just, I've just had a chance, I guess, since that discussion to look at, at what seems like a pretty big discrepancy. And I'm just wondering if we could take a closer look at yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly one of those items that we want to follow up on and be able to come back and, and break those numbers out and understand where those numbers, uh, how those numbers were generated. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I mean, I'm going to speculate that it's because that 60 or 70 extra kids are not spread evenly among the existing routes and because we don't want to have kids on a bus for, for over an hour, it may be because you have to add routes in order to do that. But that's, there's no reason to speculate. I don't know. I, there's no reason to speculate. Exactly. There's right. absolutely no reason. Okay. I mean, so, I, I, and I I'm not asking for speculation. Yeah. I'm just asking for a, a relook at those numbers because it just seems like a pretty big. Absolutely. Sure. Well, one, I think and one I, of the things. Go ahead. I I'm would sorry. say any question that you have that is either too detailed to get into right now um, or to which I don't have the answer, um, I know their questions are being written down and we will certainly get you that information. Okay. Terrific. Yeah, no, I think one of the things we've been quite clear with Dr. Freeman about is that we, whatever else happens with this proposal, we don't want any surprises in terms no, of. No, that's uh, right. And but also, you know, again, when we see things that, on at least on the surface, seem to not make sense, it would be helpful to just have a, a deeper dive. Yep. No, that's. I appreciate the question, and we'll clarify. Um, what other questions do we want? What other information do we need from DMC, other than what we? I guess already talked about. It's sort of a question, but also a bit of a comment because we talked for more than an hour prior to this meeting. Um, but in order to get really good numbers on how this would impact the district, for instance, walking budget in, impacts buses, you know, to really have that information because we have a budget vote in, in three weeks, um, that sort of information, I mean, some of it, I guess, has to come from. The district, I don't know how much DMC would provide, but do you have a sense of um, how long and what, what it would take to get really good detailed information that we could base a you know, budgetary decision? Sure. I think that um, the next level of information that you need is very specific to um, decisions that you will make, for instance, the walk distance to a cluster stop that decision has to be made prior to moving forward with more specific um, um, proposals. Um, so walk distance, um, which scenario we're looking at. So each of these has so many variables attached to it that um, my, my suggestion is that you begin to think about at least going deeper into one now to see um, how you, you know, to make some decisions about those variables and then see. I'm not sure that the level of detail you're looking for to make a budget decision um, that ha may have several hundred thousand dollar implication can be made with a lot of confidence in the next two to three weeks because it's also uh, determining um, where each of those cluster stops is going to be. Um, there's There are factors that need to be just even looking at every street in the district to determine which ones are safe for walking and which are not um, is something that would need to be done because you would never want to put a cluster stop on a street where it wasn't safe for a student to walk. So there's, it needs to be a survey of all the streets in the district. That takes time. So these are all things even if that... tonight we said we wanted to do option two and we don't want to walk more than a half a mile, it would still be very There's still... Um, I think that you... Um, you still have a fairly big swing in terms of cost that I don't think you're ready to, to nail down. And again, it's like um, safe streets, where the cluster stops are, what happens to cul-de-sacs, which ones you know still need pickup within the cul-de-sac, where can students walk to the end. Those are all very, um, very particular decisions that um, need to be done by looking almost at every single street in the district who lives on that street you know I've seen scenarios where and a lot of this is done uh, the, by the way you have an excellent 
uh, software system that um, can take all of this input once we know what the input is and come up with some models pretty quickly, but all that background work still needs to be done. And, and I would say that it isn't as if the, it could have been done earlier because in order to move forward, you needed to have scenarios that you would attach those decisions to. So um, I, I, I don't think it's a matter of um, the district sh moving, um, should sh having this information in the next couple of weeks because the deliberate process that the district is going through, I think, is commendable. This is a big decision, and to do it without all of the facts, um, it would be, I think, uh, risky. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very, thank you very much. much. We will be You're back welcome. in touch with other questions and and absolutely proceed accordingly. Look forward to getting the list of questions. We'll work together on those answers. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, as I think I said, we've turned to this issue of the turf fields, and I do, and, and I guess technically we're under item 12 on the agenda, which is public questions and or comments. I just want to reiterate where we are. I, I gather the, the recent interest or the interest over the weekend in the turf fields was generated by an article in the New Haven Register uh, a week or two ago. Um, that article concerned an action by not our board, uh, not a vote by the Board of Education, not a decision by the Board of Education, not a recommendation by the Board of Education. It had to do with a vote of the Guilford High School Building Committee, which is not the same as the Board of Education. The uh, fields, playing fields in the town of Guilford are not under the jurisdiction of the Board of Education, whether they're affiliated with a school, attached to a school, next to a school, near a school, or in the area of a school. They are under the jurisdiction of the Standing Fields Committee, which is a committee appointed by the Board of Selectmen. They report to the Board of Selectmen. They do not report to the Board of Education. The particular uh, field uh, involved here is an exception to that because when the referendum was passed creating this new high school, the, se the selectmen appointed a uh, building committee, uh, a Guilford High School building committee, uh, to make recommendations and decisions on how to spend the appropriated money and how to, how to adequately and, and uh, professionally and capably build this building and the affiliated playing fields. The, um, the genesis, as I understand it, of the, of the second turf field uh, at the new high school building here was, at least as I can tell from reviewing minutes, uh, was first uh, proposed or considered by the Standing Fields Committee back in February 2015. The Standing Fields Committee did some investigation as to alternatives, uh, talked to the uh, Guilford High School Building Committee. The St Guilford High School Building Committee asked for the opinion of the Board of Education in May. Uh, the Board of Education in May uh, expressed its opinion that if certain conditions could be met, mostly relating to budget, that the, the Board of Education thought that a second turf field was a reasonable use of appropriated funds recognize that it was not the decision of the Board of Education. It was the decision of the Guilford High School Building Committee, uh, w admittedly with the, with the concurrence and support of the Board of Education, but nonetheless the decision of the Building Committee. The Standing Fields Committee then continued to investigate it, got alternatives, it went to the, back to the High School Building Committee. The High School Building Committee, as I read the minutes, considered it over the period of time in the fall and the early winter and then in December, I believe, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but in December of 2015, the Guilford High School Building Committee, uh, as an agenda item, voted to uh, uh, move forward with at least getting bids uh, for a second turf field. The High School Building Committee has not had any communication with us asking for anything relating to this project since May, nor have we seen a reason to offer them any uh, information uh, since May because it is, it is their project. So uh, having said that, and this, by the way, is the same model that was followed with the existing turf field at the high school, uh, the football field. We were asked for our opinion about that in 2006. We gave them our opinion about it in 2006, but we also made it clear that it was not a Board of Education project, and it was a project that was undertaken by the Standing Fields Committee, and actually that went to a town meeting, uh, and, but it was under the control of the Board of Selectmen. 
And that's the way it works here. That is the process. So um, it is there. I understand that people are interested in this. It's not an agenda item tonight. I don't want to shut anybody off, but um, uh, the um, we haven't been called on to do anything, and uh, I, 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 would, I would appreciate it that if people want to put something on an agenda for a Board of Education meeting, that please reach out to me uh, and give me a little bit of advance notice because this, again, is a really busy meeting tonight. Just a point of order, are you going to take comments on the this, communication yeah. issues since that was on the agenda? Uh, yeah, we could do that, yes. Okay. Uh, the, and, and, and that's fair. That would be actually a, a reasonable thing to do at this point. Um, uh, since the... If people want to comment, technically, uh, under the way the agenda is put together, the, if people wanted to comment on the turf fields, um, it would be under item 12, which is at the, when the rest of the business of the agenda is over. I want to try to be respectful, though, of people who have come out tonight and heard uh, some issues relating to transportation and heard some, some other issues, and we'll try to get you out of here as quickly as possible. But it's true that there, if there are people that have comments on an agenda item, you come first. And so if you've got, if there are comments right now on what we just saw, the DMC study or anything else to do, well, just that, because that, that's all that's on the agenda. We're not going to vote on anything relating to start times tonight, obviously. So do you, do you have a comment on that? My name is Marion Breeze. I reside at 42 Arrowhead Drive in Guilford. Um, one of the issues that was brought up, um, and I, sorry that she's not still here, um, was um, that you have numbers on the current utilization of the bus system, and I understand it was only a week in time, but it's a great snapshot to start with, um, and that some of the modeling that they're talking about is um, based on increased ridership. So if we have increased ridership, that means that there's some data that we can use to estimate decrease in traffic. And if we decrease the traffic by a fairly significant margin, because we're increasing ridership by a fairly significant margin, then that's going to impact how long it takes those buses to come through our neighborhoods. Traffic is a huge issue, particularly in the morning, um, coming to and from Guilford High School, and also, frankly, getting in and out of Adams um, and Baldwin. So as you look at those scenarios and you're looking at that bus travel time, I would just urge you and DMC to take into account the reduced traffic. We heard from Representative mm -hmm. Candeloro tonight <clears throat> that when Branford reduced, uh, made their start time earlier, that there was a significant increase in um, traffic reduced ridership. So that's a measurable number that we should be able to, um, to take into consideration. And I would bet that there is going to be some, some fairly significant difference in that that could affect the, um, both the travel time for the students that are on the buses as well as you know, start time, end time, I see that there's, there could be as much as 10 to 20 minutes. I mean, it's hard to speculate, but having sat in traffic in Guilford now since 2005 for kids missing buses and that early morning at, uh, coming to Guilford High School, I think that that's worth discussing. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, when students were asked, you know, you, you, I appreciate that uh, these students were um, – brave enough to share their opinions and to try to give some insight into the student population. Um, I have spoken to several students who were involved in the advisory, and what I heard from them was a little bit concerning. Um, some of the students noted that the loudest student in the room, or the one who was most likely to speak, that the whole conversation, particularly if that student was seen as a leader, that the whole conversation would be swayed in that direction, um, that there were also teachers who had fairly strong feelings about it, and that a lot of those conversations were directed in one way or another, um, and that students who didn't feel as comfortable speaking up were not necessarily heard. So as you talk to, to students and get their opinions, I would just ask that you consider that. Um, years ago, students were asked about open campus, right? The campus was closed down. Uh, students were not allowed to leave. That was a hugely unpopular decision, not just with the students, but also with many parents. It was the right decision, and it was a health and safety issue. Having students leave campus um, you know, or being able to leave during a study hall as a senior privilege uh, was a bad idea. And you guys made the right decision, the Board of Ed made the right decision, or the, the high school made the right decision in stopping that. And I would encourage you, as the Board of Ed, to consider this an equally important health and safety issue. It's not an education issue. I understand it affects education, it affects transportation, it affects athletics. But at the bottom line, it's a health and safety issue. Finally, um, for those of you who talked about the survey, 
I, as a parent, did not receive the survey. There were several parents who noted on Facebook that they didn't receive the survey. I get the compass. I get, you know, a lot of other things from Guilford High School, but I did not receive the survey. Um, somebody said uh, at the last meeting, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But we also heard from pediatricians. We've heard from um, the Yale Ch Children's Sleep Center and um, from data across the country it is broken, and it's also broken in here in Guilford. We heard from local pediatricians who talked about it as a health and safety issue and the kinds of things that they're seeing as pediatricians in local practice. So as you look at this, I know no decision is being made tonight. I know tonight was a transportation issue, but some of these other issues were brought up um, when you asked if it was, you know, when we talked about whether or not it was going to be in the education committee discuss discussion at the state level. I would urge you to also consider it as a health and safety issue at the <clears throat> state level. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Does anybody else want to uh, address us on this issue, on the bus uh, and the start time? Yes, please. Hello. My name is Sharon Johnson from 29 Norton Avenue. And um, it was very helpful to see the two-tier and three-tier presentation from Dr. Ullman. Um, I also wanted to add something which I have sent to a number of representatives here, um, some information about another three-tier option that was used at the University of Minnesota. Uh, in their study, uh, they actually studied two different school districts. Uh, it was a five-year study. And what they did was they actually, in their three-tier approach, they actually took the high school schedule and just switched it with the elementary. So the elementary students were picked up first and the high school was picked up last. And logistically, you know, the parents were concerned about problems with young children standing on street corners in the dark. And <clears throat> so they did uh, turn to some specific um, strategies where they had alternating parents um, one parent on a Monday took care of that corner, another parent on a Tuesday, and they cover the bases with um, monitoring the younger children at the, uh, at the, the corner waiting for the bus. Uh, what they found was a sig statistically significant impact on their academic achievement, specifically on the core courses, the GPA, uh, for those core courses and also on the um, standardized tests, the ACT and the SATs. And this was moving the start times from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. for the high school students. Um, they studied the sleep, work, and school habits of 12,000 secondary students and over 3,000 teachers and then the interview data from 750 parents. This was over a five-year period from 1997 to 2001. And their findings were a st uh, statistically significant reduction in dropout rates, increase in graduation rates, less depression, anxiety, fewer disciplinary referrals, uh, improved attendance, improved academic performance, less sleeping in class. It was found prior to this that about 20% of the students were sleeping the first two hours of class. Um, homework was completed in less time due to their alertness and efficiency. And they had an increased total sleep time from approximately six hours a night to closer to seven and a half to eight hours which is closer to the National Sleep Foundation recommendation of nine hours for this age group. Interestingly, 92% um, of the parents preferred later time start for the high school students after one year, despite the earlier concerns about busing, athletics, childcare, and after school employment. They also said their teenagers were just easier to live with. <laughs> um, they did, by the way, complete a second study from 2011 to 2014, and this was a three-year study funded by the CDC, um, 
consisted of 9,000 students, uh, and it covered eight public high schools over three states, Colorado, Wyoming, and Minnesota. Uh, they again switched to the later start time uh, from the previous study of 7.30, switched to 8.30, and it confirmed the previous study results. In addition, however, there was one uh, very important difference, and that was a 70% reduction of teen car crashes in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, according to the CDC, insufficient sleep was associated with 10 health risk behaviors, cigarette, drug, and alcohol use, sexual activity, feeling sad or hopeless, suicidal ideation, physical fighting, lack of physical activity, overuse of computers, excess consumption of soft drinks. And the um, additional health concerns of the CDC were the link between chronic insufficient sleep and obesity and decreased immune function relating to decreased melatonin levels and decreased insulin secretion, which could lead to prediabetes and diabetes, increase in ADHD, and an increase in pathologically sleepy children, which means falling directly into REM sleep in only three to four minutes, which is a pattern similar to na narcolepsy. And so while this is certainly a very complicated issue in terms of logistics. Um, I was taken by the, the, the work that the University of Minnesota did in their um, applied research and educational uh, initiative study. It's uh, called CARI for short, C-A-R-E-I. And um, so I, you know, I, I don't know if that option was, was part of the discussion to actually minimize transportation costs by switching the... It was. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did uh, circulate the information, by the way, to the entire board that you, that you did forward. Uh, Mr. Hewn, I think there's somebody in back of you. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he moved first. <laughs> I'll be just quick. Uh, my name is Sebastian Derda. I live on Long Hill Road. I just have kind of a three things about this whole bus uh, situation. Is um, I I saw that saw it on the on the board there that uh, some of the drop off times were like 4:30. How does that affect the people that live in North, North Guilford? Um, and especially the younger kids with the particular to a spring sports and fall sports. Um, the kid will get home, you know, right around 4.30, 5 o'clock, and some of the sports start at uh, 7 o'clock or 6.30, and then you add the commute time in here. It's just, it's almost impossible for the kids to concentrate on the homework. Uh, some kids uh, need a little extra time on homework than the other, and it would definitely affect those younger kids with the later drop-off times. Um, another thing is um, the walking of a quarter mile to three quarters of a mile to these uh, cluster stops. How does this really affect those kids that have to walk those three quarters of a mile? They still have to wake up the same time, and in addition of that, they still have to walk up to that three quarters of a mile to the cluster to the cluster stop. And uh, one uh, last thing is: uh, is the school prepared? for as far as uh, all the umbrellas and hats and boots. Does the school have enough storage to put, to put all that in lockers or whatever the kids are going to store all this equipment that, they, that they're carrying with them going through these cluster stops or walking the streets? Where are they going to put all that stuff, all these umbrellas and hats and jackets and boots that they have to have a second pair for sports activities after, the, you know, after school that they're going to be participating and stuff? So that's all, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In, in, I, I just want to make crystal clear that everybody understands. I understand it was on the slide that at least for the upper level grades that the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the model that they're using includes walking up to three quarters of a mile. That, that is just not going to happen uh, on any 
systemic basis. There's no appetite for that on the board. Uh, it's in, it, that might work in some places. It doesn't work in Guilford. It, we're too spread out. We've got too many small roads. So let's let's concentrate. We got we got. 50 things that are problems uh, and issues in this. That's not one of them. Uh, so, Mr. Hewn, please. Bo Hewn, uh, 465 Clavert Hill Road. Uh, I'll keep this very, very short. I uh, uh, commend you for taking this so seriously, studying it, working on it, and uh, very interested to see what the outcome is going to be. I. Uh, personally very much support the idea of having later start times for the the high school kids and I uh, uh, over the Christmas vacation showed uh, six of my grandchildren and actually two were in college but uh, uh, four were were still in in high school uh, a TED talk on the subject of <coughs> sleep deprivation and and uh, mental illness specifically. And it switched the kids from thinking, ah, who cares, you know, doesn't matter, to uh, all six of them came out saying, wow, I didn't realize how important sleep was. And thanks, uh, they call me Rainbow, for, <laughs> for showing us that. And, and uh, I, I uh, realized that it is that important. So uh, that's one piece of anecdotal evidence of what happens to the kids' thoughts when they've got the, got the information on it. So thanks. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Mr. Hanbro. Any, anybody else on the high school start time issue? And I should say, by the way, that, that would, regardless of what we do as a board, this is not anywhere close to the last time this is going to be talked about uh, as, uh, with the board. I, I think it's quite fair to say that there will be public hearings and meetings as we move forward and have got alternatives a little tighter uh, uh, pinned down than where they are right now. So this is, we're still, we're not exactly in the early stages of the process anymore, I guess I would say, but I think we're, we're not anywhere close to the end stages of the process. Uh, uh, but anyway, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to express an appreciation for Mrs. Balistracy's um, Kind of, kind of insight and taking a, a closer look at those those numbers. You weren't the only one that saw the discrepancy on it, and uh, and it, it, it to, I guess just somewhat of a trained eye. The, the, those percentages and the number of bus runs didn't didn't add up. So I wonder if there was a possibly a mistake or, or whatever. Again, I don't want to speculate, but I, I think it is it is a great idea to to look into that a little bit further. So we so we do have a better projection on on uh, expenses with it um you guys able to at this time sh share what the data um from the survey says and if if not um a, a timeline and how that will be shared out you want to talk about that i have slides that i can share during the balance of my report yeah i'm prepared to put those slides up when i take okay. the podium awesome um la last one um I certainly get a, a sense that this isn't realistic to make this happen for, for the 2016-17 school, school year. Um, with that, that being said, I noticed in the, in the report that um, DNC was making a recommendation to create better efficiencies by either training our current um, transportation, um, either I, I, I didn't understand if it was in, in the use of the so software or kind of the science be, behind route, route planning and that type thing, or to use a, a consultant. Where exactly do we, wh where are we in terms of that, that concept for the upcoming transportation year? Are we bound <coughs> by contract to 25 or 32 buses for the year? Is it possible to, to use some of that money, money for the upcoming years to create some some more efficiencies in that transportation account in terms of do we actually need 32 buses for, I guess it was the elementary in the, in the middle and, and 25. Do we, do we know that at this time? We, one of the things that we're going to be talking about as part of our budget process is reordering some of the stops. Uh, the, uh, we did get some valuable information from DMC. We do have a new transportation coordinator. We do have better software now, so we are going to be looking very closely at whether there are things we can do to try to make the, the whole drop off and pick up process more efficient. Having said that, the, the, one of the major drivers of the number of buses that we have is the combination of the size of our town and the desire not to have kids on a bus for an hour and a half. 
you know, there are there are at least three routes where buses have to go outside of the town of Guilford to get to children inside the town of Guilford. Yep. Uh, it, this is a very spread out town, as you know, and and um, it's a, that's why it's a little. It's a little unfair to just be concentrating on capacity the way she was talking about it, because unless we're willing to keep kids on a bus for an hour and a half, well, you're, you're, there, you're, there's a ceiling on how. On right. It, right. No, that was that was clearly articulated yeah. in, in the report that balancing game, game with. It. I guess my my question was they they pointed to either either more training for the transportation person or or, or a regular consult to more the concept of certain number of routes in the morning certain number in, in the in the p.m. versus kind of our current practice of for lack of a better words this is how it's been done for 10 years we, this is we, how we're going to continue we are in a it. position right now that we are able to and looking very carefully at making some significant changes okay. just comment on that i mean i think it's a good point um, about the efficiencies and just to comment on cluster stops this came up in the prior meeting i think we suggested one possible way to approach this. If we're not ready to do it this year. Cluster stops are, are required for the changes that we would make to go, particularly if we went to the two routes, um, because we just can't do it without um, the efficiency of the cluster stops. Understood. The current schedule, um, while we have some cluster stops, it sounds like there are there is the ability to move to more efficient um, stops that that could be done this year and that's something I mean you know we're gonna and that might this. save some time right mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and I'm and certainly and not and advocating money. opening the can of worms now in terms of cluster stops and I mean I, I understand that's a very very sensitive issue but with that being said seeing where some of those ridership numbers are it, it does appear that you could leave kind of the current practice in place in terms of where where the pickups are and that type thing and still look at the possibility of reducing some runs and possibly not you know if you're bus one in the morning it may not necessarily mean you're bus one in the afternoon 10 runs in the morning and 15 in the af afternoon whatever that ridership is is, is all my suggestion I, that's no, fair. We're, we it are, appears I've I put the bug in the air. That, yeah, yeah. No, that we've we've, we've, we've mm -hmm. talked about that, and we do have some expectations now with the new transportation coordinator, the new software. We are going to look very carefully at that. I apologize, Nate Jacobson, 1470 Long Hill Road. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I meant to remind you. <laughs> yep, that's okay. All right. Anybody else on the start time transportation, please? Good evening, I'm Lorna. I live um, off uh, Manor Road. So what I would propose is that, you know, the scientific evidence is pretty much overwhelming. Um, I don't think that it's unreasonable to say that the question should be for Guilford um, if we should move the high school start time later, but more when and how. Um, you know, I researched a lot of information provided by you know the school board initially and then went a lot further and read quite a bit more myself um, as a registered nurse that's that's what I do for my career um, you know we make our decisions based off of evidence um, as opposed to opinion or past practices etc and the health and safety of our children is it, it has to be paramount in in school board decisions as far as I'm concerned um, as a parent and a nurse, um, I have an elementary school child and also a middle school a middle school child here in, in Guilford. Specifically regarding transportation, um, my children already go to cluster bus stops. Um, I measured it after the first meeting just to see where, how far is it from my house. It's 0.1 miles. That's the average that came out in the first report. The you know the information that came out. It just happens to be that way. Um, and he also, there was a, there was a lot of talk um, from parents. It was, you know, very informative to get information from other parents, how they view things, how their lifestyle would be impacted. Um, and a lot of people were concerned about high school students crossing Long Hill Road. My son crosses Long Hill Road now uh, to get to his bus every morning. Um, so the cluster bus stops, walking point one miles, and crossing, you know, main roads already exist in Guilford. And these are roads without sidewalks. Um, I've never felt my son to be in an unsafe position because you can be 100% sure he wouldn't be in that position. Um, there are times I have driven my son to school. 
Um, but I can tell you I more frequently drive my children to school um, in order for them to sleep later. I'm very well acquainted with the effects, uh, the long-term and the short-term effects of sleep deprivation in adults and children. Um, it's, it's not a game. It's, it's a, it has long-term serious consequences. Um, this issue has been studied over and over again, not just moving school start times, but you know the sleep habits of adolescents, what they need, uh, what's healthy for them. Um, I, I'm not going to cite a bunch of evidence, um, although there is a ton of it out there, good quality um, studies, etc. There is uh, one that I'll cite out of Fairfax, Virginia, a place I used to live in Arlington. Um, it studied 28,000 adolescents. That's a, a grand sight more than we have here in Guilford. Um, that covers every spectrum of family income, you know, demographics, racial demographics, etc. And what they found was that for every hour of lost sleep for adolescents, there's a 38% increase in them feeling, uh, experiencing feelings of hopelessness, sadness, and a 58% increase in attempts of suicide. Okay, that, I take that very seriously, as I'm sure you all do. I'm sure you all do. Um, I think we should you know, consider moving from if to, to when and to how, and I think you've done a fantastic job. I really I admire our school board and I admire the, the, the town of Guilford and our people for looking into this and not having to wait until there are, you know, every neighborhood in, in the state has already moved on the issue. Um, I think that we, ha we have a, a special town. We have intelligent, educated, caring, uh, passionate people in this town, parents, educators alike. Um, I, I think that Guilford can lead on this issue. The health and safety benefits are clear for children and the community as well. Um, after our last meeting here that uh, I sat through the entirety of, I have to tell you, uh, my car was struck on Route 9 a couple of days after, afterward. It was an army um, gentleman coming home. He fell asleep at the wheel. I have the state police report to show it. Um, and he hit my car. I have to tell you, my children were in the car not 30 minutes earlier. It affects everyone. Children who are tired at the wheel, you know, I'm, I'm talking about our, our older children. They are um, at as much or as at as much or more risk as drunk drivers. How much do we care about our kids not drinking and driving? A lot, I think. So we should really care that they don't drive tired, also, and that we also don't. You know, we, we have to model good behavior. Um, I would support a move to more of a two-tier busing system as opposed to three. Um, some of the parents had brought up concerns about mixing age groups that are currently separate. Uh, my children are five years apart. I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my kindergartner was there, you know, with my fifth grader. Um, my, you know, when he moved into first grade, you know, he could have been on the bus with, uh, you know, when my other son was in sixth grade. I would very much welcome that contact. That, that my two children, you know, even five years apart, could travel on the bus together, um, at least for some portion of the trip to school and back from school. I find that very, um, I, I, I would find that excellent. Um, my kids go, both go to Sun Catchers, and they seem to be able to manage very well with kindergarten through seventh grade um, kids, as well as the high school kids who then come and help out at Sun Catchers. Um, I have a lot of confidence in our kids, and I think that really they are really relying on us to do the best and, and you know to put their health and safety first mm -hmm. and to put our own inconveniences which are real don't get me wrong I'm not saying that, that they're not uh, I am a single parent myself I manage my children by myself um, I have to engage before school care after school care at different times and the transportation is hundred percent on me um, but our inconveniences and discomfort with change I think that, that we should be looking at the health and safety benefits for the kids first and, you know, decide that we will do it and decide, you know, and then work, you know, focus on, on how, and, how and when, how and when. I'd be interested to see if money could be saved in the next school year um, by institu instituting <coughs> more cluster stops, um, by having kids walk a little bit. I mean, I, you know, I was a Navy brat. I had the benefit of growing up from Hawaii to Europe. You can thank my father for my funny accent on that. Um, I have taken the bus in Hawaii where we had to walk to the bus stops. I have had to walk to school in Scotland, which was much farther 
than a point one mile or a point a half a mile, okay, in pretty rotten weather most of the time, I have to say. I, I much prefer Connecticut's weather, <laughs> even though we have a couple of cold months. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with kids walking as long as it's safe. Uh, I think that, you know, a thorough review of the town roads to see which ones are safe for kids to cross and which ones just aren't uh, is fantastic. I'm very much looking forward to seeing that, as I'm also looking forward to seeing all of your input, as I'm sure very many of you took the time to fill out those surveys. Um, and I would say that that's about it, and I thank you for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Please. Brian Wiley, 69 Davis Drive. I have several points, so I'll be very quick because we have a busy evening ahead. We do. And We're about halfway through, through, I'd say, right now. That's it? We're right. about halfway through, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Bring out the caffeine. Uh, three observations I wanted to make, and we're privileged to have two medical doctors and a Juris doctor, of course, on the board, <laughs> but in particular the medical doctors. Uh, we heard from our local representatives earlier about significant drug problems. I would suggest that, as I'm sure you will do, that you consider some of the um, factors that, that can lead to heightened drug abuse among adolescents, like stress, anxiety, feeling of disconnection, all sorts of things that we've heard in a number of studies, whether from North Dakota or Minnesota or wherever, that are brought about by sleep deprivation. So please consider that this is a health and safety issue on several levels. Um, just, just a quick aside as an indication of how much the body really does need sleep. As some of us know, and this is a bit of a melodramatic statement, but it's true. One very popular interrogation technique is the doctors are uh, understand sleep deprivation. I'd rather not put my kids through that, uh, even though they do it sometimes. Um, a third observation is, and you doctors may want to check the research, or maybe you're already well aware, that as the brain is becoming better and better understood and how it works and how facts and experiences that are absorbed throughout the day enter long-term memory, it's becoming much, much clearer that for those facts to enter long-term memory and be stored in a recoverable way, adequate sleep is re required. It's not just driving, it's learning, it's, it's whether or not kids perform well in life in the long run because they're learning properly when they're younger. Um, two quick observations about budgetary concerns. Roughly speaking, and this math is pretty straightforward, we don't really know how much this would cost. We have a very rough ballpark of $250,000 for option two, I believe, and it could be less than that. It could be a better benefit to the community that hasn't been factored in, it could be significantly more than that. That number is a little over 0.4% of this year's budget. When we talk about the benefits here, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind because most all of this discussion tonight has been, I, I, not so much tonight, but some of the letters to the local paper and some of the conversations at the last presentation are focusing understandably on the issues and the challenges. We need to keep the benefits in mind, and to my way of thinking, 0.4% is not all that significant. Uh, sure, it's money, but it's also for the health and education of our kids. Uh, that The numbers, if you take that number and spread it out over the, just over the high school kids for that additional sleep time, that every study we've heard shows has significant benefits. <coughs> and some of those benefits are very long-term. It's about $1.50 an hour. That might be worth considering as well. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Anybody else on this issue? Okay, then as promised, why don't we turn to the question of the, of the, uh, the building committee's vote to <coughs> Well, I, I guess whatever people want to say. I, again, this is not on the agenda. It's not a Board of, Deci board of Education uh, issue right now. It's not, we're, we aren't called on to, to, uh, to, we have not been asked by the Building Committee or by the Standing Fields Committee to do anything. I know there are representatives of the Standing Fields Committee here this evening. I think there are also representatives of the Building Committee here. But if there are people that want to address us, I'm, I give you the opportunity. I, just would like to suggest that in the future, give me a couple of days' notice ahead of time, and we can we can put on on an agenda, and we can try to 
uh, focus it a little bit. But in any event, um, if somebody wants to be heard, wants to say something to us, please. Now, now is a good time. Please. Just give us your name and, uh, and address. My name is Margo White from 683 Ritchie's Way. Um, I'm the mother of four, four boys who will undoubtedly be spending a lot of time on the existing and proposed rubber turf fields. Um, uh, I'm a teacher. I have a degree in community health. And I'm a founder of a business that evaluates ingredients for toxicity in consumer products and educates the public on their safety. We're partners with the Coalition for a Safe and Healthy Connecticut and the national organization Safer Chemicals Healthy Families. Um, I, don't, I understand that we don't have a lot of time to talk, and I do have a lot more to say. Um, I feel that the recent study, which probably many people have heard about in the New Haven Register from the summer of 2015, uh, led by Dr. Benoit of Yale School of Environmental Chemistry and Engineering, looked at five new samples of crumb rubber tire infill and nine new samples of rubber mulch. The study revealed 96 chemicals, half of which had no safety data. Of the chemicals that have undergone toxicity assessments, 20% are considered probable carcinogens and 40% are considered irritants, causing respiratory, eye, and skin problems. Listening to the entire conversation tonight about the health, safety, and well-being of our children, I don't feel that this is being addressed, and I think it needs to be. And I think for the people that are here that want to know where we can voice our concerns, we need an answer as to where we can go from here. We'd like to request that safer alternatives be looked at. I am not against a turf field, but I think that more research needs to be done before this is moved forward. So if we can't talk about it tonight, when and where can we talk about it? Well, again, to be, to, to just as a reminder, it was on our agenda in May. Mm -hmm. And it was at a televised meeting just like this. And mm -hmm. nobody came. And it's been on the agenda of the Standing Fields Committee, I think probably 10 out of the last 12 months, 9 out of the last 12 months, it's been on the agenda of the Standing Building Committee, or not the Standing Building Committee, the, the Guilford High School Building Committee for probably about the equivalent amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done anything on this since May. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will say that, that, that we are quite familiar with the state of Connecticut research on this mm -hmm. issue. Uh, we, are, we are not writing on a clean slate in Guilford by any stretch of the imagination. We, we were... Well, let me, let me hear from other people. I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, uh, uh, and maybe I'll just summarize kind of what, what, the, what the information we had was uh, a, a little later. But uh, you've raised your concerns here. I, I, the, the, the building committee is the committee now that has the jurisdiction over moving forward. It's their decision. It's their vote. They did it with our concurrence. I don't want to minimize. I don't want to suggest mm -hmm. that we didn't have anything to do with it. But it's their decision. It's their money. We don't, we don't, there is zero dollars, there is no money in this budget that Dr. Freeman is going to be presenting us later this evening to do anything about a turf field. I just want to be very clear about that. But the answer to your question is where, where can you go next? Yeah, I mean, I feel that, um, and I, I, pro I know I speak for a lot of other uh, Guilford residents, that um, something so controversial as this that's high in the media that it should have been made more public of for so that more people could get involved in this and um i know that i speak for a lot of parents that feel the same way i think we've answered that i think <clears throat> the the committee right now that has jurisdiction over this field this particular field is the high school building committee so when do they meet, and can, are we able to attend a meeting, or how? It's how a public we... meeting. Any any meeting is you're absolutely entitled to attend. Okay. I think their agendas are on the the town website. Um, when is there a meeting scheduled? The next meeting is scheduled for a week from tomorrow. The agenda has not been posted. Most of their meetings include a time for public comment. Some, like yours, are workshop meetings. They're all open to the public. Most include time for public comment. Okay, so we'll be there. Okay. Please. 
I am Vasilis Vasiliou, 1158 Jennifer's Drive. I'm newcomer to Guilford, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to give you for three. I'm going to talk to you for three minutes. I'm not against the field, but I would really like to uh, be sure that everybody understands that there is increased concern about the artificial turf. I'm fully aware of the Connecticut study of uh, the health department. I have to tell you, and I can show you the abstract of one of the presentations at the end, they found higher concentration of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and they mentioned they have with appropriate uh, ventilation, this should not concern, should not be a concern. However, remember we have climate changes, we also have a lot of other factors that need to be taken. And one of the thing is, for our kids' sakes, I mean, I have three young ones, I have five kids, we have five kids. Nobody has measured levels in either blood or urine of those um, compounds that they've been found in this. I'm just trying to raise awareness. If, they, if the committee is fine, I mean, if the, you guys are aware, if the parents are aware, if the committee are aware, it's about our kids. It's not an ego, it's not anything we're not trying. If a study shows that the amounts of this, comp I mean, there is no, nothing detectable in urine or plasma of those kids, yes, then it's safe. But until then, everything else is a little bit, you know, um, superficial and needs deeper studies. That's what I'm saying. I don't want any, you know, well, I'm just trying to express my, no, it's fine. Thank my you. opinion. Let's, let's Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Joe White. I'm from uh, 683 Vinci's Way. And I just want to start by thank you for giving me the time to come here and speak. I'll make this very quick. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm here to voice my concerns about the turf fields that you guys are looking at installing and you know we my wife and I weren't aware of this you know that it wasn't really really publicly um, out there that you were doing this so this is the first we heard of it that's why we're coming to you at this time um, I did a little bit of research you know I'm not going to get into the, the the pros and cons there's a lot of studies for it and against it as far as the safety of the kids um, my biggest concern a lot of this was talked about today about starting school at certain times relating to the safety and health of our children. And this, I'm surprised that this got pushed through like this, because even if you go to the um, Department of Public Health, it says there's still uncertainty and additional investigation is warranted. That's right on their website. So I'm, I'm, I'm I just... Have the, I have the report right here. Well, I'll talk okay. about that in a second. Okay, but I, that's, that's, that's what's said. And then Senator Blumenthal also says that, you know, you should wait before you do these things before you put in a field like this. So I'm, I'm just a little put off, I guess, that the fact that this was pushed through when all the research I've done says that you should wait, that there's potential health hazards to children. I mean, people can say, oh, well, it's not a big deal, but there are carcinogens in here. There are things that affect children. And everywhere I look, it says it, further investigation is warranted. So I think you explained to my wife how the next step, we have to get in front of another board. But is this closed? I mean, what is my recourse as a parent with four kids that are going to be playing on these fields? Is this completely closed, or is there potential to bring this up again? Or can you, have, you, you, you need to talk to the committee that's got jurisdiction over that issue. Okay. It's, this isn't our decision. I, I, I really appreciate that everybody came out tonight. Sure. Uh, you know, and I, I've seen the emails saying show up at the Board of Ed meeting. No, if somebody had said to me, gee, where should we be? I, I would have said before the committee that's got jurisdiction over this issue. But I, again, I'm not, I'm trying to be, you know, I think all, all of us are, you know, you're our constituents and we're happy to hear from anybody who's got a concern. Um, this just isn't, we don't have the ability to either push this through or not push it through right now. Understood. It's not our Understood. project. No, and I appreciate the time and I just wanted to voice, you know, we came here to just kind of voice our concern to the board because I know you guys had input on this. You know, you approved it. So you looked at the information, but the information says that further investigation is warranted. You know, and that's the theme when I researched this type of material in this field. The theme is further investigation. And we talk about safety and health for our kids, which, you know, you're a big part of that. Well, so, okay. Let me, let me, I, I'm saying it so you 
you know, as a group, can reassess your decision as well if we do bring this to and, and maybe, maybe this is a good point to say, to let people in the community know what information we did have at the time. Okay. Um, this is not our first go around with an artificial turf field. The, the first go around was the football field that was in 2006. We're not at all writing on a clean slate here, or a blank slate, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, we were aware of questions about health and safety concerns back in 2006. I think Dr. Myers was on the board at the time. I was on the board at the time. That's probably it among the nine of us here. Um, but uh, we were asked for our position on the endorsement of the turf field at Guilford High School. Mr. Schmidt actually was there at the meeting. Uh, we made it clear that the proposed turf field is not a Board of Education project, and then the board voted in favor of an endorsement, but, uh, but nothing further. Now, after that, shortly after that, Dr. Katz, who writes a column uh, for the New Haven Register, wrote a column in 2007 that roughly says some of, the, some of these issues relating to what's in this stuff, what is, what is, what is available. So we started to look at that. And, I, and specifically, the concern was lead. Is there lead in the artificial turf field? That's been a big issue for some people um, and, and some uh, types of turf. The manufacturer of the turf then came out and hired a, uh, a consulting firm to actually do tests on our particular football field in 2008. Uh, the, uh, they did that at the, at the request of Rick Maynard, who was our park and rec director. Uh, studied, uh, the te study tested for zinc and lead levels and uh, water runoff, uh, and uh, the, uh, the results were that, that it was within limits. It was safe. It was not much different, if any different, from the regular runoff from uh, sure. soil. So then, what, though, that we wanted to do our own testing. We hired our own firm. We hired Mystic Air Consulting, which does most of our, of our air testing at, in schools. And on June 9, 2008, Mystic reported that there was zero detectable lead in the football field uh, here. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission then, in the summer of 2008, says CPSC staff finds synthetic turf fields OK to install, OK to play on. It's July of 2008. The state of New York Department of Health then does a fact sheet in August 2008 as a result of studies that says um, as to the five issues that they were looking at, heat stress, injury, infection, latex allergy, and chemical exposures, their conclusion was based on the available information, chemical exposures from crumb rubber and synthetic turf do not pose a public health hazard. That's what we had available to us. Now, sure. you're right about Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Blumenthal. And, and now what I think has been forgotten that Mr. Blumenthal, when he was the Attorney General back in 2008, was pushing for studies of his own. And he said, that if I'm going to find money to, to, to do studies. Well, he did find money. He sued somebody, and they settled with him <laughs> on, a, on a completely unrelated case on a building, on a housing development in Middletown. And he got $200,000, and he was able to hire uh, uh, a, the, the Department of Public Health, Department of Environmental Protection at the time, mm -hmm. now DEEP, and, uh, uh, and they, they had a, a set of peer researchers, and these are all available on, sure. the, on the state website. Um, th it was from 2008 to 2010, and we had this available uh, sure. to us, and um, the cancer risks calculated by DEEP, well, the, this is the peer review. Based on these findings, outdoor and indoor artificial turf fields are not associated with elevated health risks from the inhalation of volatile or particle-bound chemicals. However, it would be prudent for building operators to provide adequate ventilation to prevent a buildup of rubber-related VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and SVOCs, semi-volatile organic compounds, at indoor fields. And that's the point that the last gentleman made, that if we had an indoor field, it would be a really good idea to make sure well, the building's ventilated. You know, I guess the, the point that I'm getting at is you know, I'm not here to debate the science behind it. Because, you know, that, that's a very long debate and there's a lot of different things. Even about the levels that they say are safe, there's a lot of people say those aren't safe. And they don't ever do a study where they're looking at all the toxins that somebody's exposed to at one time because it's very difficult to do. Nor do they do studies on the long-term effects of those. I guess what I'm saying is there's enough evidence and there's enough concern. Just if you go and Google this, there's enough information out there that says, hey, we're not sure. Right? So why would we be doing that when you're potentially risking the ki uh, health of our kids? It's not, you know, it's not, hey, it's not as good a field as something. It's the health of your children. And there was a lot of, you know, I'm talking the senator. I'm talking the 
Well, the, uh, the I, public. Look, I, 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 look, okay. I know. We, I, we, I, we, we, it, we understand. It means a lot to me because I have four kids. We, and it's very concerning to me. We understand that there are good faith disagreements by people, and you know there is. I think probably in in public education, there's a good faith disagreement about lots of lots of issues. We get mm -hmm. that. We understand that. But we had this data available to us, and the data said that. The, the assumptions underlying the risk, risk assessments, well, the conclusion fails to indicate, this is the peer review of the DPH mm -hmm. report, we, then the criticism was that the DPH report was too alarmist, that it represented too big of a, of a series of, of challenges to health. The conclusion fails to indicate that the risks are highly improbable, reflecting a series of system, systematic overestimates of exposure and risk, and including a contaminant, benzene, that is almost certainly not actually off-gassing from the crumb rubber. When, when, when our, you know, we are technically officials of the state of Connecticut. We are appointed under Connecticut general statutes. I understand that there are people that disagree, but we, we have some, you know, I, we can't do our own research. If the, the Connecticut Department of Public Health tells us that this is safe, mm -hmm. that carries some weight with us. Now, there are some things that can be done, and this is actually something the building committee, I hope, will take into account. There are things like pre-weathering the crumbs to make sure that the off-gassing has already occurred most of it before it even gets installed. And that's fine. That makes sense. You can ask the manufacturer as to representations about lead content and make sure that, um, uh, well, you know, and all of that. We do of need to take a break, though, yeah. because we have to change the tape.